Yes, learning by doing and lessons learned. Good morning. Don't fuck with the poor. If you make a promise, you keep it. It's a moral contract. It was very uncomfortable to ask Billy the question, what were the impacts when the money stopped? And uh, some of us cried when we watched this video. Right. Um, I'm a fan of basic income. I volunteer for four organizations that work for basic income. Um, I'm on the board of the Dutch basic income movement. I'm a vice chair of basic income Earth Network, Mission Possible 2030, and I'm the co-founder of UBI Blockchain Collective. So yes, I am a fan, and that's for a reason. Because basic income is about unconditional love for people that you've never met. And it's more than poverty relief. Um, I'm going to talk about the project in Kenya, but I want to give you the example of my daughter. She's, a tra she's, she's training to become a nurse. When she graduates next year, she will graduate with a debt of 40,000 euros. It's a vital profession. That's how society is. If she had had a basic income, she would graduate as a nurse without a debt. Basic income is about freedom. It's about absolute freedom of choice. No judgment. And you just give money to the people. And it's no coincidence. Billy, Billy mentioned so many different effects, a variety of effects. But we see that everywhere. If you go to Kenya, to India, to Namibia. And that is because people have the freedom of choice to spend their money or whatever they want. And not everybody wants a goat or a bus ticket or food vouchers. It's about restoring freedom. No mandatory servitude when you're on welfare. Human rights. These are seven articles in the uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's about brotherhood and sisterhood without distinction. A right to life, liberty and security. No slavery or servitude. A free development of your personality. Free choice of employment and a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being. So we're all responsible to contribute to the realization of basic income. And basic income leads to self-organized, distributed, autonomous opportunities based on human intelligence. And I'm fed up. I mean, for decades, we've been advocating for basic income, explaining basic income, explaining the results of the, of the pilots. There was always an excuse not to implement it. So the organizations that work and say that they are working for, to reduce poverty, they should really ask themselves, do I really want to solve the problem of poverty? IMF. Dozens and dozens and dozens of strategy papers for poverty reduction. How much money do these people earn? World Bank. Dozens and dozens and dozens of papers mapping the poverty. Offering loans to countries to solve their problems. What are they doing? Sustainable development goals. Many millions and millions and millions of dollars are spent on plans and papers to, reduce, to, to contribute to the goals, focusing on one or two, maybe three. If you introduce a basic income, it contributes to the majority, if not all, the sustainable development goals. One intervention. And I feel this sense of urgency because of what they're implementing. A system of total surveillance and control through the money system. The central bank digital currencies that are coming are really scary. And they will, people will only be able to buy things that they are authorized to buy. And you guys probably, and girls, <laughs> probably don't have that problem, but the ordinary people that have no idea of what's coming, they will be slaves through the money system. So it's up to us to decide which future we are going to build. Are we going to sit back and wait for that system to be implemented? Or are we going to collaborate and 
build a preferred future. Not a possible future, not a, 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 a possible future, but the future that we want. And we can do that, thanks to blockchain technology. But the biggest challenge is, can we reach that last mile? And that last mile is people without a phone, without access to internet. People that want to use their local national currency, because that's where they, what they can use to buy their goods and services. People that are not literate. Do we want to force them into smartphones? I mean, smartphones are handy, I have one. But they're also a track and trace device. They're also a frequency weapon. It's also a, a tool for crowd control and mind control. So I don't want to force people that have no clue about a smartphone to give them a smartphone in order to get money, to receive money that they need to survive. If they have a basic income and they choose to buy a smartphone, great. But we're not going to force them into smartphones because they, that's the only way we can, we can think of to get the money there. So we really need to get the money to the people before the infrastructure of total surveillance, control and manipulation is in place to make people resilient to what is coming. We are the multinationals and we have all the building blocks to get the money to the people directly. And the people themselves will know what to do with it. So the only thing we have to do is bring the money to the people, let go and enjoy the show. So that's our vision. We don't have to wait for politicians. We don't need more evidence. We know it works. The only thing we need to do is bring the money to the people. And we, of course, invite you to be part of it. So you have met Billy. And uh, Billy is not the only one uh, coordinating this project. Um, we also have Evans. And these are the most important people in this project. And when the project started, I think it was Billy who, who contacted Sarath. And he said, please, Sarath, help me to make basic income happen in the village. So we had a meeting, and Sarath said, shall we do it? We said, OK. <laughs> Our meetings are <laughs> very short <laughs> decision. So Billy uh, already explained to you that we started with 10 people, you know, uh, $10 a month. And these are those first 10 people. And you can see you cannot drop a box of smartphones with a wallet installed on it with some cryptocurrencies and think that you have given them a basic income. These are the people. There are more children in the village than adults. So in these houses live, you know, like four or five, sometimes six people. Then Impact Market came along. And they said to us, we have a lot of money. Can you help us to access communities? We said, OK, <laughs> let's try it. We have access to many communities, but we don't have the money to provide it. So let's do a pilot and choose a rural area. Uh, and let's see if we can reach that last mile. Uh, we need uh, an amount that can actually make a difference. So $7 a week in a, in a, in a place like Kenya can actually be life-changing. It has to be something that can be exchanged into their currency. We don't want any data mining. We want the community to be in the lead, and we want them work together with the community to see if we can reach that last mile. So, and we said to them, if, that, if this pilot is going to be a success, we can provide you with more, many, many, many communities. Yeah, we have an urban, urban community that Sarath will be talking about later today, uh, ready to receive, and we have many, many, many communities. We have a worldwide network. Now, Kenya is relatively easy because they already have an M-Pesa system in place, an infrastructure of mobile payments, and in every village you have these M-Pesa shops where you can use your uh, features phone and get your uh, physical uh, notes, um, so that infrastructure is already there. So from a blockchain perspective, the entrance is the M-Pesa system. Then you can let go. And together with the community, they themselves came up with a solution to reach the people without a phone. You know, it was a very creative solution to think of, OK, if you just buy a SIM card and you just uh, borrow someone else's phone, you can claim it. Then you go to the M-Pesa shop, get your cash, and then you give the phone back. 
only together with the communities we can solve these problems. So how did it work? Impact Market has an app, the Valora app, and they distribute a stable coin, uh, the Silo dollar, which is around, well, when I, when I calculated, it was 759 Kenyan shillings. Then we had to work with a fintech company in Kenya called Kontani Pay, and they provided the USSD integration so that the money was uh, exchanged to uh, Kenyan shillings in the back end, so the people that were actually participating didn't even realize that they were, were actually receiving a stable coin. And then if they choose to, uh, to, to have uh, physical cash, they could go to an M-Pesa shop and they would lose, lose a little bit more. So in the end phase, they would lose a lot, well, almost a little bit, a little bit less than 6%. Yeah? So from the $7 minus 6%, they would receive. The people that worked the hardest were Billy and Evans on a voluntary basis. They did the uh, interviews with uh, villagers. They, you know, made an overview of how many people were there. They did the clan meetings, the village meetings, the training. They organized support for the elderly and the illiterate to be able to claim. They had to cope with the disappointments. They had to explain to the surrounding villagers, well, be patient, be patient. That was almost a full-time job. These people are my heroes. What is the situation now? We have 358, they call it beneficiaries, we prefer to call them participants, uh, 358 adults. This is uh, 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 their, um, uh, an overview of the last month, and as you can see, there are only 20 claims in the village in, in the month of August. Only 20, which is 140 euros in total. Um, they use a community wallet, you know, where they... Uh, uh, bring the, the uh, where they transfer the the, the, the stable coins, and then every every single person has an individual wallet that is connected to the M-Pesa system. Yeah, don't. Um, <laughs> it's a moral contract. What was the reason that the money stopped? It was the bear market. So they had a stable coin, but they didn't have stable funds because they kept you know their their their, their funds in. Uh, uh, currencies that were pro, uh, uh, vulnerable to the volatility of the market. So yeah, if you if you distribute a stable coin, it feels stable. But if the funds are not stable, then it doesn't really matter. <laughs> then it turns out now it turns out that they're also trying to um, convince people to use their DeFi products. So they're trying to set up, you know. Uh, 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 um, insurances, digital insurances, money lending systems. And that might be a good thing, but if you realize that the people themselves also can organize decentralized finance, which I call the uh, wheel of fortune, you know, in, in, in many experiments we see, what we see happening is that people form a group of people that they know and trust, and then from their basic income, they give, for example, if you have a basic income of $28 uh, dollars a month, they decide to give $3 from that income to one person, and then the next month to the other person. And that means that every one month there's one person who has a bit more, so they can invest in a, buy a cow or, you know, a goat or whatever. So that is also decentralized finance, but in a physical form. What do we have to do now? Because, you know, we are not leaving them. <laughs> Um, we, we made a promise. We made a promise that we will stand with them until the last mile is reached for all the adults in the village, for starters. So we really need funding to fill the gap that Impact Market left. So that's around 200,000 euros in total, I think, for an income for a year. Then we need to onboard the remaining adults. That's 100 uh, people. And then we want, really want to reach the children as well. We've discussed that with uh, Billy and Evans. They, they prefer that we go to other villages first before we, before we go to the children. I think we have to do both at the same time because they have so many children there. And um, a basic income is unconditional for everyone. So it's also uh, unconditional regarding age. So we need time of skilled people to help us 
with the technical solutions. Yeah, for example, if we have a, a, a fund of uh, with the cryptos, then we need our own USSD integration so it can so we can reach that M-Pesa system. So we really need help of technical people who can help us to do that. And of course, we need money. Well, if you have a spare, a few spare DAI or ESC20 tokens, you can donate today. We <laughs> we tested our Gnosis Save yesterday, so and it works. But this is what we should do in the long run, in my opinion. A very simple model. Let's start with the last mile. The last mile can only be reached with the community. In Kenya, it's the M-Pesa system, relatively easy, but you can also think of a peer-to-peer -peer exchange shop instead of an M-Pesa shop, or find other creative solutions. Yeah? Together with, with the communities, it's context-specific. That's the only way we can reach the last mile. We also need a pool of value or a sovereign fund that is stable for not only today, but also for the next generations. And there are many ways to, uh, to fill that fund. We just have to be creative. You know, if you can create a DAO or uh, to, 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 to earn passive money for yourself or your company, you can also copy paste that DAO <laughs> and create another one to fill the fund. Yeah, or you can use your staking things, do donations, corporate social responsibility. Um, that cannot be that difficult. A smart contract is only smart when built by warm-hearted people. And we're actually aiming for wisdom. And we really seek collaboration with people from the blockchain space to build together. And uh, I know you're all busy. But, um, you know, this is for humanity. Thank you. I think we have a quick segue into the Hyderabad work free experiment, uh, closely followed by um, a panel. Um, I wonder if the audience has any questions for Hilda the presentation and the findings from the Kenya on-ground service, the lessons learned. Alles good, then we can move on to Salat. I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunity with the panel, so. We have one question. Um, yeah. Um, I'm curious, like how it, um, how the basic income, what effects it has, in terms of, does it enable local trade more, or does it enable people to buy things from the outside, or what is the main effect? Is it like, yeah? Uh, the effects are numerous, but you heard Billy say, I don't know if you were here when Billy was online that the local businesses were booming. So even the villages uh, that did not receive basic income, because people, for the first time, they had money. I mean, there were people there that never had uh, an income in their whole life, you know? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, local businesses are community. It's a renaissance. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, basic income is a renaissance for local, for small and medium ex uh, businesses. And, um, you know, the, the um, it's... Domestic violence is reduced. Peace, peace on household level. Nutrition. People, uh, children go to school. They can pay the school fees. Uh, they can go to the doctor. Um, uh, they um, uh, one the the best story in the, in this village is that before we had this project, local politicians would come to the village, yeah. and they would ask people to come to uh, their venue. They would have to wait there for three hours. And then they would be paid one dollar just for their presence, you know, for the politicians. Yeah, I'm very popular. So many people coming here. But they were coming for, one, for that one dollar. When basic income arrived, these people said to these politicians, I'm not coming for that one dollar. I now have seven dollars a week. You bring us policies instead of, you know, promises. And they managed to get this new drinking water facility. You know, because they had a better position to negotiate with the politicians. So these are effects um, that are life-changing. 
I mean, this project is a success and also a failure so far because the money stopped. But these changes are forever. Yeah? So they're also organizing a, a health facility in a neighboring village. So uh, on every domain, things change. But it's context-specific in the region, it's context-specific on the household level, and it's context-specific on the individual level. And that's why you see an endless list of effects. And you see that in Kenya, in India, in wherever you go. And that is because of freedom, the absolute freedom of choice. You, you mentioned that you wanted to reach the children. Um, are you thinking about a specific age? And can you tell me why? Uh, I genuinely don't understand that much because I think adults are probably the best to you know, know where to put this money or to send their kids, as you said, uh, to school. Uh, yeah, why? Yes, yeah, so our experience is that um, if you want to reach the children, the best way is to do that through the mothers. Um, and uh, yeah, any age, and uh, it can be uh, uh, as high as you know what you give to adults, but it can also be uh, uh, half of it. That's what usually is done. Uh, my personal opinion is just give them the same amount, and then they can save for for later or whatever. Um, no, yeah. So as soon as you're born, you're entitled to a basic income because the only condition you have to meet is being human and alive. Nothing more. Sounds good. Thank you for your time, Hilda. Very quickly, ne up next we have... <laughs>